dokey. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all. I am Christy Bevington with the Nebraska Realtors Association. This is Professional Standards Training 9999T. You will receive three hours of broker training credit for this course. In order to receive the credit, you must be in, atten in attendance the entire instructional time. Sign your name on the proctor sheet. We're only going to sign it once. Okay, that's all you got to do. Just say you're here. That's good. We're happy. So, there we go. And your broker must have already signed the uh, TRG2 form before so we can get that to the commission. Proctor sheet's going around. If your name's not on it, please put it on the back. And that is all we have with that. Now I'm going to introduce our instructor, Don Martin. Don Martin, known as to many as a professional standards and procuring cause guru, has literally trained thousands of realtors in professional standards procedures. He is a facilitator for the NAR Realtor Leadership Program, an NAR Certified Professional Standards Procedure Instructor, and serves as a GRI instructor and participates in teaching mediation and professional standards workshops. Let's welcome Don. Thank you. Thank you. How's everyone doing? Great. And by the way, if you want to sit back in the back of the room, I'm coming out to the back of the room with you. <laughs> There's a bunch of, bunch of people that need a little help back there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, it's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. And uh, how many were here in the morning class? Okay, a, a, a lot of you. And I'm going to say this again. I thank you for being here, and I commend you for being here in, in the role that you're playing through professional standards to help upgrade the real estate industry in, in your state in Nebraska. So I thank you and commend you for being here. Now, uh, we're going to uh, try to do something here differently. This class is scheduled from 1.30 to 4.30. Christy asked me if we can take a short break in the middle and then uh, in closer to 4, around 4 or something like that. and. I said we can do whatever you want to do. It's your class. And, and I'm going to say this again. I said it this morning, and it, it caused a bit of a problem, but we're going to take a short break in the middle. If you need to go to the restroom before then, please do. And this time, I really mean it. <laughs> I was told in the morning class that we couldn't do that. Anyway, so this is professional standards training. Let, let me get a feel for here, uh, who's here. How many of you are here as members of a grievance committee of a local association? Local association grievance committee. How about state association grievance committee? Okay. How about uh, local association professional standards committee? Okay, how about State Association Professional Standards Committee? A, a couple, three, three here. All right, uh, anyone here is here because you are a director at the local association. You're here because you're a director at the local association. No one? How about State Association? You're a director at the state? Both. Both, okay. Both. Both. All right. All right, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and turn to your handout, and the start of your handout should be the class outline. Now, as I start through the class outline, let me just go ahead and say that in a lot of areas of this, and there's a lot of stuff in this outline, but uh, a lot of the stuff in the outline is self-explanatory. I'm not going to be glossing over it. It's just that there's nothing that needs to be said about it, and there are times when I will elaborate. And then at different times during the class, we'll do some group exercises. But anyway, so starting off, as soon as I get this to work, and uh, some of you weren't here in the morning class, this is my contact information in case you want to uh, be able to contact me in the future, that is okay. My, my cell phone number, my email address, that is me in the picture, my wife Alice. That is the triple crown winning racehorse, American Pharaoh. For the, and, and most of you I know don't follow horse racing, but American Pharaoh was the triple crown winner year before last. Someone in the morning class asked me if that's my horse. Yeah. <laughs> this, this, yeah, I wouldn't be here if that were my horse. Believe me. 
Uh, he raced as a two-year-old and a three-year-old and earned somewhere around five million dollars, but then he uh, became a stud. Last year he earned somewhere around 38 million dollars. And, and, and this year, not only did he stand at, at Ashford Stud in Kentucky, they now have sent him to Australia for the season there, so he's doing double duty. So this year he'll probably earn more than 50 million in stud fees. So no, that's not my horse. Okay. These are the course objectives. To be able to protect the public through enforcement of the Code of Ethics. To understand due process rights, what they are, what they're for. The next one is to explain the hearing process. All right, and then we'll go to uphold and enhance the integrity of the real estate industry through enforcement of the Code of Ethics. To be de able to describe the penalties for violating the Code of Ethics define proper conduct for committee members, and serve the membership by resolving complaints and arbitration disputes. All right, uh, this is on page one of your outline, still on page one, we're going to go through due process rights, and this is a part that doesn't really need much elaborating, except for maybe the first one. That all parties in the process, complainants, respondents, have the right to, well, it's the, specifically the respondent, has the right to know the charges with specificity. The charges are examples of conduct. That, that ha the conduct has been cited as the basis for a violation. The, the respondent has the right to know the conduct they're charged with violating or for violating and the articles. So the conduct and the articles. All right, the next one is 21 days notice prior to a hearing. Both parties have the right to 21 days notice prior to a hearing. Next is that each party has the right to know any witnesses or counsel for the other party. So th those names must be provided to them. Must have the right to prepare a defense. Must have the right to challenge hearing members, professional standards committee members. They must have the right to call witnesses to present evidence and testimony, and also to conduct cross-examination. Right, continuing on with due process rights, each party has the right to make a closing statement. Each party has the right to be represented by counsel. They have the right to legal counsel, and in ethics, in an ethics hearing, the party also has the right to be represented by realtor counsel. So they could be represented by legal counsel and realtor counsel both. And actually they both serve the same function. Realtor counsel in an ethics hearing uh, performs exactly the same functions as a lawyer. And, and I'll go through in a little while what those are. All right, if you will turn to page two in your outline. Page two in the outline, we'll continue on with the, with the due process rights. The parties have the right to a hearing panel that is impartial and is qualified. They have the right to, to get the answer, to know what happened in the hearing. They also have the right to file an appeal and related to the appeal to get a copy of, of the transcript of the hearing at their own expense. So those are the due process rights. All right, the next section is tribunal. There are three tribunals involved in the professional standards process. Grievance committee, professional standards committee, board of directors. And actually, let me ask this question. Do, uh, in any of your associations, do you, uh, have you relegated the role of the board of directors to the professional standards committee? Has anyone done that? And you do have the right to do that, but apparently no one has. Okay. All right. What was the question again? Have any of you, uh, the question was, uh, in any of your associations, have you relegated the board of directors' role to the professional standards committee? Yes. Who, who said yes? State. State association. 
So with the state association, if you have an appeal, it's done by a professional standards hearing panel. Yes. Okay. All right. All right, but anyway, with the tribunal, you may have a maximum of one person per, per firm serve on that tribunal, like grievance committee. You cannot have more than one person uh, from the same firm on the grievance committee, except, and I'll talk about panels here shortly. Also, you may serve on a maximum of one tribunal. Is there anyone here? Who here is a member of the Grievance Committee and also your board? Okay, who here is a member of your Professional Standards Committee and also your board? Yeah, and the point to this is you can only serve in one step in the process. If you serve as a Grievance Committee member on, on whatever the issue is, and they're like, and the grievance committee dismisses the matter, and it goes to the board of directors for appeal. You cannot serve at the director level, or if you're on the professional standards committee and you serve in the hearing, and then there's an appeal from the hearing that goes to the board of directors. You cannot serve in the appeal. Only one step in the process. Oh, and if you have any questions, please stop me. Yes. So on that. Can you be a director on a local if you're on a grievance or a professional, or are you just talking about the state board of directors? Uh, I'm, I'm talking about, well, um, I'm talking about, for example, if in your local association you're a member of the Professional Standards Committee, <coughs> excuse me, and you're on the board of directors. So you serve on the hearing panel uh, at the local level and then there's an appeal which would go to the board of directors. You cannot serve on the appeal panel, board of directors. The same would apply at the state level. And but if you heard something, if there was something, something that got appealed from the local board to the state association, you also could not serve again. Only one step in the process. Does that make sense? Well, in Nebraska, it's all referred to the state level, so we don't have a local level. You, professional standards. Oh, I'm sorry. You have, do you have just statewide professional standards? Yes. They oh. provide that as a service to all boards. So Nebraska is a, state, a statewide professional standards only. Only. Excellent. All right, so now you're, you're serving at the state level. You can only serve one step in the process. Grievance or professional standards committee or board of directors. Now you can be on more than one of the tribunals. You can be on the grievance committee and the board of directors, but you can only serve in professional standards in one step through the process. Does that make sense? Now does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. And then there are reasons why you would be or could be disqualified from service through the process. The first one would be if you're related by blood or marriage to a party or witness or counsel to the complaint, or if you're a business associate with, uh, to a party that would be in a hearing, or a witness that will be called for the hearing, or any counsel. So if you're related by blood, marriage, or adoption to one of those, one of those parties or participants to the hearing, you're disqualified for serving. And also, and I'll talk a little bit later about challenges to professional standards committee members. If you're successfully challenged, then you can't serve. All right, and the National Association of Realtors changed a couple of years back to allow the use of panels. So for grievance committee, and let me ask you this. How many members on the State Association Grievance Committee does anyone know? Guess? 10, 15? 6. Somewhere around? 12. 12 and 6. Hmm. Are you on the grievance committee? No. Are you? Yes. Okay, and you, you say 12? Okay, now, do you know if, if uh, in the grievance committee panels are used? What, what NAR policy says is the grievance committee can use panels of three or more. 
So in other words, if you had 12 members on the grievance committee, you could have four panels of three, but you don't do that. Nothing. Okay, but, but you're allowed to, to do that. And let me ask you this too, uh, uh, how does the grievance committee meet? Do you meet in person and have a meeting? Conference call. Defense. You do conference call, okay, good. And, and the uh, Code of Ethics and Arbitration Manual not only allows you to do that business by conference call, it, it actually encourages doing that part by conference call. Hmm. So good. Now, and actually let me ask you a, a, a couple more, well, I'll, I'll do this, but let me go through this part. Professional Standards Committee, how many members on the state Professional Standards Committee? Does anyone know? Anyone have a guess? 25? Would 25 be a good guess? Okay, and of course the, the Professional Standards Committee can use panels, and that's typically the way we, that we've always done it, is by, is by panels. You do it by region? Five regions. Five regions, so you, you have panels that get appointed by region. Okay. Also, the Board of Directors, if the Board of Directors is involved in the process, the Board of Directors may also have panels and it, it's what the manual says is a quorum of the Board of Directors or five members of the Board of Directors, whichever is less, or the Executive Committee. Now, but here, here's the question I was trying to get answered before. So if you're statewide professional standards, what body handles appeals? Professional Standards Committee or Board of Directors? The board. Does the board handle, and how many members are on your board? State, the State Association Board of Directors. Does anyone know that one? Board of Directors. But, and, and do you know how many members there are on the State Association Board of Directors? Close to 20. Close to 20? 27. 27, okay. Actually, that's a fairly small board. But, the, but uh, for a state association, when I was president of the state association, our board of directors was 140. Oh, You're what? 4,400? Oh, okay, okay. But, but anyway, so yes, uh, the board of directors can use panels. You wouldn't want 25 directors uh, going through an appeal. You can use five or you can use the executive committee. You have an executive committee at the state level. Okay. All right, now we're going to go through the role of the grievance committee through the process. And first of all, there cannot be ethics mediation. Does your state offer ethics mediation? Mediation for once the ethics complaints have been filed? You, pardon me? You have ombudsman. But how about ethics mediation? Um, One person said, I don't think so. I would guess not. Okay. If, 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 you, if you cannot, it doesn't, then this point doesn't matter. But the point is, if the grievance committee uh, proceeds as the complainant, ethics mediation cannot be offered. And the other part is, if it's a complaint, that would possibly constitute a violation of public trust, then ethics mediation cannot be offered. If there's a complaint that alleges a violation of Article 1 and it would have caused monetary damage to the client, that cannot be mediated. If it's a violation of Article 2 that would show intentional misrepresentation, which is the basis for fraud, that cannot be mediated. And a violation of Article 10, which is a fair housing issue, that also cannot be mediated. All right, this is the function of the Grievance Committee. The Grievance Committee performs a limited screening. It performs an initial review. And by NAR policy, the review must be completed within 45 days of the complaint being filed. All right, so this is the role of the Grievance Committee. Initial review. You don't hold hearings, you don't do interviews, you simply receive the complaint, you look at the complaint, 
identify the, the allegations. You don't get into the merits of the case. You don't come up with findings. You take the complaint as true on its face. All right, and then you determine if there's a basis for a hearing, if there's a possible violation. All right, there, there's something there on your page about a, a quiz or example. We're not going to do that yet. But anyway, continuing on with the Grievance Committee, I already talked about that, or this. The Grievance Committee can have panels of three or more. All right, so Grievance Committee, by at least a majority vote, determines if there's a basis for a hearing, if there's a possible violation, and, and in reviewing the complaint, a, a number of, of issues come up. One of them is, is, it, is the complaint in the proper form? In other words, did they complete the association's complaint form? And usually that's a, the function that staff will perform for you, association staff. Are the necessary parties named? So you, you go through the complaint and think, for example, when I was the managing broker for a company of about 1,200 salespeople. And because of the size of the company and the volume of the transactions we did, we did about 1,000 transactions a month, then complaints got filed. I mean, that's a lot of transactions and a lot of exposure, so complaints got filed. Sometimes the grievance committee would add me to the complaint because I was the broker and they thought that maybe I should be held responsible. So you have that right as the grievance committee to, for example, add the broker to the complaint. If you think there, there's something that the broker didn't do right or, or should have supervised better or something to that effect. Also, was the complaint filed within 180 days of when, a, when the facts could have been known in the exercise of reasonable diligence? 180 days after closing or discovery, whichever is later. And it's 180 days, period. It's not 181. And AR policy gives a statute of limitations for 180 days. Next is, is the respondent a member of the association? If the respondent's not a member of the association, we can't discipline them. So we can't hold a hearing. And also is litigation pending. Um, first of all, litigation in court or a complaint that was filed with the Nebraska Real Estate Commission. So these are questions you ask as members of the Grievance Committee. And then proceeding on, is it possible to impanel an impartial hearing panel? Are the appropriate articles named? And is there a possible violation to the Code of Ethics? All right, ne next step is to return the complaint to the complainant if it's unclear. <clears throat> Have any of you ever seen a complaint that was unclear in serving on the grievance committee? Yes. <laughs> I'm thinking it's just about all of them. <laughs> now, in fact, I didn't, I didn't tell you this part. My, my activity involved in this process started in 1982 and was continuous through 2009 till I moved to Chicago. And if I hadn't moved to Chicago, I would still be serving in professional standards. But, so my service was continuous. I, I chaired grievance committee <clears throat> a number of years, served on the professional standards committee and chaired professional standards committee at two, di two different local associations plus the state association, served on the NAR professional standards committee and served on the NAR interpretation subcommittee. So I had however many years that was, 1982 through 2009 of continuous service. During that time, I chaired grievance committees a number of years and also chaired about a thousand hearings. So that's, and so that's what I said about when you see those complaints, are they ever unclear? There are a lot of them that aren't clear. So you need to get it clarified by the complainant. Also, if it's not in the proper form, if they didn't complete the association's form, then it needs to be sent back to them. And the, the other one is, and sometimes in ethics complaints, the party will ask for money. 
Well, they don't get money through the ethics process. If they're asking for money, that would be a request for arbitration. So the complaint has to be sent back to them for them to correct it. They can ask for, they can file an ethics complaint. They could also file an arbitration request, but they have to do those separate from each other. All right, considering, uh, continuing on, not considering, but continuing on, a member of the grievance committee, and I don't know if your association does this, but a member of the grievance committee can provide procedural assistance to uh, a would-be complainant, and that, that, might, uh, that might, or maybe, let me say that differently, could be where your ombudsman is involved. To go through with that person, talk to them about how uh, their issues compared to the code of ethics and there might be a basis for a complaint and how to go about filing a complaint. That could be done by the ombudsman. But also a member of the grievance committee is allowed to do the same thing. But if, if you do that, you are not their advocate. You're simply providing procedural assistance in getting their complaint filed. And if you do that, you must also disqualify yourself from consideration when it goes to the grievance committee. All right, any questions on that part? All right. So hey, question. Yeah, question, yes. You said about disqualifying yourself. If you were in the ombudsman program and it went on to a grievance committee, could you then disqualify yourself from the grievance committee? The question is if you were involved as the ombudsman for that issue and then it went to the grievance committee, would you disqualify yourself? Yes. Okay, page four. As the grievance committee, th this is your process. You determine the allegations, and the allegations are not articles, the allegations are conduct. L let me give you an example. So, and, and this is a real simple one. But the complainant said in the complaint that the listing agent refused to present an offer on their listing. All right, so that's the charge. That's the conduct. All right, so the grievance committee identifies the allegation, the charge. They, uh, they then compare it to the code of ethics. Compare it to the code to determine if it would be a violation. All right, so the process works like this. It says the grievance committee is a screening committee comprised of members of the associate, I got this out of the Code of Ethics and Arbitration Manual. Members of the association appointed to the committee. Key question for the grievance committee. If the allegations in the complaint were taken as true on their face, is it possible that a violation of the Code of Ethics occurred? What does that mean, taken true on their face? You're not investigating the claim. You're not investigating the claim you're assuming those allegations are the truth. The Professional Standards Committee will determine if they're the truth or not. All right, so these are examples of when you dismiss the complaint as a grievance committee. First of all, if it wasn't timely filed within the 180-day period. The next one is if the respondent is not a member, sanction someone who's not a member. The next one is if, if the allegations taken true on their face could not possibly support a violation. So here's the question. If we assume the allegations are the truth, is it possible there was a violation of the Code of Ethics? And if the answer is no, even though we consider the allegations to be the truth, there's no possible violation of the Code of Ethics. And I think I uh, used this one this morning, but uh, this is a complaint I saw that was actually filed. Two realtors, husband and wife, they were having a new home built that, by a, a major builder. The time for construction was about six months. They entered into a rental agreement, six month rental agreement. The owner or the landlord of, the, of that home filed an ethics complaint and said they weren't paying their rent. Well, would paying their rent be subject to the Code of Ethics? No. The Code of Ethics doesn't require us to pay rent or our mortgage payments or our bills. 
That's personal stuff. NAR policy says a realtor can only be found in violation for real estate conduct that violates the code of ethics. So that would be an example of one that would be dismissed. And actually I'm going to, uh, we're going to do an exercise here shortly and, and I'll show you another one that should have been dismissed. All right, some special challenges. What if there is criminal litigation pending out of the same set of circumstances as the ethics complaint? What do you do? You have to put it aside. You have to put it aside. You cannot, you cannot hear it. Cannot. How about if it's civil litigation? Is it the same thing? No. Not actually the same thing. But let's go through that process. Uh, a number of years ago, when I was the professional standards chairman for, for a very large association, one of the largest in the nation, and, and actually I was, I was holding a hearing, I was conducting a hearing on an average once a week, chairing a hearing, an average one a week. And I kept complaining about the stuff the grievance committee sent forward that shouldn't have been sent forward. And that they were always making mistakes. So the CEO of the association said, well, I've got the fix for that. From now on, you're going to be the grievance committee chair. So you can make sure they do it right. <laughs> so for about four straight years, I was the grievance committee chair until Arizona went to statewide professional standards. And then I got out of being the grievance committee chair. But, but anyway, the, so uh, w one of the first meetings I chaired as grievance committee chair, we got a complaint and there was also a complaint pending with the Arizona Department of Real Estate. So I started to have the grievance committee discuss whether we forward it or not. And the CEO of the association said, our attorney said we cannot forward those. We must hold them in abeyance. And I said, well, it's not the attorney's decision. It's the grievance committee's decision. And the manual says to the contrary. The manual says it's our decision as to whether we forward it or not. And these are the criteria. All right, so we look to see, now when there is a civil litigation pending or a, a complaint, for example, to the Nebraska, Nebraska Real Estate Commission. All right, so the degree of similarity of the two complaints and also the degree of action of the other body would make action by us unnecessary. For example, if you, if you receive an ethics complaint and out of the same set of circumstances a complaint's been filed with the Nebraska Real Estate Commission and it looks like one where they would probably lose their license, we don't need to hold a hearing because if they lose their license, they lose their membership anyway. All right, and then the degree of delay that, that might be caused by holding it in abeyance. The, the other thing it says in the manual is to get assurance from legal counsel that either holding the hearing or not holding the hearing would serve due process. Now, here's the way I've looked at this one over the years. To me, the due process, the, the rights of due process in this case are the respondents, the realtors. They're the ones whose rights are being affected one way or the other. Now, this is not a requirement, so don't, don't say that I'm, or don't think I'm saying that. But what I have said is, I think the association should check with the, with the respondent and see if they want to have it held in abeyance or, or abeyance or if they want to go through with a hearing because they're the one being affected. And I don't know about the Nebraska Real Estate Commission, but all those years in Arizona and the Arizona Department of Real Estate would talk about how promptly they handled those complaints. Well, that's nonsense. They didn't promptly handle any complaints. It took them forever to decide on one of those complaints. And for example, with one, of my, with one of my agents, one of my salespeople, a complaint was filed against her at the real estate department alleging that she forged the buyer's signature on the agency disclosure form. 
Well, if you're going to forge a signature, why would you do it on the agency form? But that was the complaint that was filed with the real estate department. It took them two years. I mean, that's a simple issue. All you have to do is get a handwriting expert and compare them. That's a simple issue. It took them two years. So that's why I say that, at least in my opinion, that the realtor respondent should have a say in whether the hearing is held or the matter gets held in abeyance. Well, the complaint was, was finally dismissed against her after two years. Crazy. Yeah, but it's crazy. All right now, go to page five. If you are a grievance committee, and we're talking about the grievance committee now, this is the basis to forward the complaint for a hearing. If the allegations taken as true on their face could possibly constitute a violation, then forward it. All right, so rem remember the one I said about the complaint alleges that the realtor listing agent refused to present an offer on his listing or her listing? All right, so as a grievance committee, we take that as true on its face. Taking it as true on its face, could it possibly constitute a violation? Okay, yes. Standard of Practice 1-6 says, Realtors shall present all offers and counter offers as quickly as possible. See, that one doesn't even require any thought. I mean, that's, that one's easy. You forward it for a hearing. All right, with that, we are now going to do that uh, exercise that was shown back on page three. But what you need to find in your handout is, uh, should be the next thing in order after your outline. And your outline's 18 pages. And you, your, uh, your handout is copied front and back. But what you need to go do is go to the end of the outline and find that the, the next item says ethics quiz. All right, so if you'll find ethics quiz, and it might be after code of ethics. Okay, after code of ethics. All right, I'm going to have you do some serious work here. All right, first of all, I would like a volunteer. And what I'm going to ask the volunteer to do is read to us example number one. Who will volunteer? Oh. Oh, Mark. Mark will volunteer. Mark? <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll volunteer. You'll, you'll volunteer. Okay, good. Example number one. Oh, and, and here's what we're going to do before, before you do that. Here's what we're going to do. The, now, this is a very short complaint. But we're going to assume the complaint was timely filed. We're going to assume that the respondent is a member. We're going to identify the, the applicable, applicable article and determine whether to dismiss or forward the complaint. And by the way, you do have enough information to make a decision. I hear grievance committee members a lot of times saying, we don't have enough information. Well, yeah, actually you do. Okay. okay. Ready? It's a lot of noise. I like that. A cooperating realtor took an offer to only human, the listing agent, on July 12, 2014. Only explained that the seller had countered a previous offer and had given the prospective buyers until 7 p.m. that day to respond to the counter offer. Since it was only 9 a.m., the prospective buyers still had 10 hours to respond. Only refused to present Lada's offer. He said he would hold Lada's offer and if the prospective buyers didn't accept the counter offer by 7, only would go ahead and present Lada's offer. The offer never did get presented. Lotta filed a complaint against Only on January 8, 2015. Okay. This one was timely filed. And actually, those are some old dates. But um, So, uh, first of all, what's the issue here? As the Grievance Committee, what's the issue? 
presentation of the offer. Refusal to present the offer. What article would relate to it? And, and you haven't uh, had a chance to look at your code of ethics, but what article do you think? It, it's standard of practice 1-6, so it's article 1. All right, and would you forward? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, as long as it's timely filed, you, you would forward. Did anyone actually count the days? Um, no. We counted the months. Yeah. You can't count months, though. Well, but it's still within 180 days. Was it within 180 days? Okay, so then you're going to forward. Yep. Okay, excellent. Good job. All right, who will volunteer to do example two? Right here. <laughs> the complainant, Seldon Wright, a member of the public and a former seller client of Hesse Tate, charged Hesse with disclosing confidential in information without the permission of the client. The basis of the complaint was that Hesse had disclosed to the new listing agent, even though Seldom had instructed Hesse to not disclose it, the results of a previous inspection showing that the gas furnace was in need of replacement because unacceptable amounts of carbon monoxide were being emitted. Okay. For this one, what is the issue? The disclosure. Disclosure. Of the Just making disclosure contrary to the instructions of the client, what article would relate to it? Article 2. Article 2? Okay, Article 2 about disclosure. And actually this is, this is case interpretation 125, so it's also Article 1. So Articles 1 and 2, and what would you do with it? Do you think you would forward it? No. no. No, because? Because it's a material defect. On it's a material defect which requires disclosure. disclosure. So you're saying as a grievance committee not to forward it. And actually it's a case interpretation, 125, and, say, and, and it does say that it's not a violation because it's a required disclosure. So yes, as the grievance committee, you could dismiss that. All right, how about example three? We'll do example three. Right here, yes. Realtor Island Ford filed a complaint against Realtor Burke and Cars, charging a violation of the code of ethics. Iona stated in her complaint that she had submitted a full price offer to Bergen on his listing. However, Bergen received an offer on his own from a prospective buyer at the same time. During the presentation of the offers, Bergen agreed with the seller to reduce his compensation, which resulted in the seller accepting Bergen's offer. Iona charged Bergen with a failure to disclose a variable commission agreement. The offer was provided by Iona to Bergen on June 16, 2014, and Iona found out the facts of what had actually happened on June 18, 2014. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The complaint was filed December 17th, 2014. Okay, thank you. Excellent. All right, so what's the issue? It's what? The time, disclosure, and disclosure. Not, not disclosing a variable commission agreement? Okay. What article would that be? Three. It's Article Three. Oh, it also happens to be Article One because it's Case Interpretation One Thirty. So, if you're a grievance committee, wh what do you think you would do with this one? Forward or d or not? Well, the dates. Oh, but you're going to look at the date, and it's actually filed on the hundred and eighty second day. So whether you would forward or not isn't relevant. You have to dismiss it because it's not timely filed. But what if it had been timely filed? And that, that was an excellent job, by the way, of, of catching the, the untimely filing. But what, what if it had been timely filed? As a grievance committee, do you think you would forward it? Okay. And, and actually, that would be okay for the grievance committee to forward it. But if you're the hearing panel, what, what are you going to, what do you, what do you want to know as a hearing panel? 
Let me go through a couple of things on my PowerPoint here. And we, we already did this, 1-6, submit all offers. We did Article 2, we used Article 2 as the basis. Realtors shall not exaggerate, conceal, or misrepresent pertinent facts. So disclosing about the uh, furnace, whatever it was, was a material fact. So that needed to be disclosed. And then let's go to Standard of Practice 3-4, which is about variable commission agreements. All right, so variable commission agreement is giving the seller a deal depending on who sells it. So if it's your listing and you sell it, you're giving the seller a deal. It also could be if the seller sells it, you're giving the seller a deal. Uh, so then putting that into perspective, in other words, if an outside agent from a different company sells that property, that home, then the seller will pay the listing broker three bags of money. It, whoops, if the listing agent sells it, the seller is going to pay the listing broker two bags of money, and if the seller sells it, the seller is going to pay the listing broker one bag of money. All right, so that's variable commission agreement. So now as the hearing panel, what would you, what would you want to know about this set of circumstances in determining if there's a violation? If there was. If there was a variable commission agreement or not. If there wasn't a variable commission agreement, the listing agent always has the right to negotiate their commission in a multiple offer situation. So if there was a variable commission agreement and the, the agent didn't disclose it, it's a violation, otherwise it isn't. All right, does that make sense? Yes, question. No, that's not right. Because if you have a listing agreement and you say, I am charging X amount of dollars, and this is not fair, and you have an offer, someone else brings an offer, and you say to your seller, hey, you know what, I'm going to cut my commission. Yes. You don't have to tell that other agent. Actually, you don't. There's nothing in the Code of Ethics that requires you to tell anyone. I don't, may, if you say there's something in Nebraska law, I don't know. But there's nothing in the Code of Ethics. And, and I, I don't mean to be rude, but I was on the MLS committee that at NAR that developed variable commission. I was on the professional standards committee at NAR that developed standard of practice 3-4. I take disagreement on that. Well, you, you can disagree, but when you tell me I'm wrong, I'm not wrong. Well, I know, but you're taking a disadvantage of your fellow Well, this, but legally, yes, you're saying you're, you're taking advantage of your, of your fellow agent. You can look at that way if you want to, but legally you can do that. And ethically, you can do that. There's nothing that requires you to make that disclosure. The only requirement is standard of practice 3-4 requires you to disclose if you actually have a variable commission agreement. Remember, we're going by what the Code of Ethics says, and your job in professional standards is to enforce the Code of Ethics, not have it say what you think you want it to say. What it says, that's, that's your role in enforcement. Where did I see a hand? Yes, right here. Could they, argue, could they argue that it's a pertinent fact? Could they argue? Could who argue it's a pertinent fact? The complainant. Someone like her? No, the complainant cannot argue it's a pertinent fact because the code of ethics says what it says, and we can only enforce the code of ethics for what it says, not what we think it. Oh, I'm going to talk about this later in the class. There is no letter of the code of ethics. I mean, spirit. There's only the letter. What it says, yes. Well, we were just wondering the variable, what do you call it, the variable commission agreement? Yes. I've never used anything like that. I mean, where, what situations would you use something like that? Where would you use a variable commission agreement? Where the seller, uh, the seller wants, do you remember what I started with? It's giving the seller a deal, depending on who sells it. So the seller will say, okay, I'm going to list my property with you, but I want you to reduce the commission paid if you sell it yourself, because then you're going to get both sides. Is there something in the MLS that would uh, have, you know, certain language in the MLS about the varying commission? Yeah, the language in MLS says exactly what I said. If you have a variable commission agreement, you must disclose it. That's the MLS rule. That's NAR MLS policy. 
that you must disclose it if you have one. But if you don't have one, how do you disclose it? What you're speaking of, it would be some sort of a... Yeah, there, there's something in your MLS where you disclose if there's a variable commission agreement. I know that without even seeing it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's there. <laughs> okay. All right, continue. Yes. So, I, okay, now related to this. If, I'm, if I am a buyer and I walk in to look at this house and that listing agent Can says to me... Oh, okay. So, I'm a buyer. This listing agent has an open house on this listing that we're talking about. Yes. And he says to me, there's no need for you to have a realtor. I can take care of it and save some money. Who, who said that? The, the, the listing agent tells the buyer this. Who's, is, is it a buyer who's already in an exclusive agreement? No. No. Well, well listing, listing agents can say that. It's legal. And he has this very important... <clears throat> Agreement that if, if the listing agent has a variable agreement, they are required to disclose that in MLS. And the reason they're required to disclose it in MLS, so buyers know that they're, playing on, that they're not playing on a level playing field. Yep. Okay. That's, that's the disclosure requirement. But you always have the right to reduce your commission in negotiations. That's not a variable commission agreement if you do it during negotiations. Oh, but here's what the case interpretation goes on to say. That if the negotiations fail and no contract results, that, and, and the seller says, you know, I like that idea about reducing your commission. How about if we just make that a general agreement that if you sell it, you'll reduce your commission? You say, okay. Well, now you have a variable commission agreement that must be disclosed in MLS. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Amending the complaint. As the grievance committee, you may amend the complaint. You may, uh, you determine if the appropriate articles are named, if, if you should add articles or delete articles. Like, like here's an example of a complaint that was, that was this is one where an, a hearing was actually heard, was that the uh, husband and wife were getting a divorce. The husband was a realtor. So an offer came in from a buyer represented by a buyer's agent. The husband then met in person with the buyer and negotiated a contract. A buyer who was represented. Met in person with the buyer and represented, uh, negotiated a contract. So a complaint was filed against him. He was then found in violation of Article 1 of the Code of Ethics. Well, which article is about interference with agency? It's not one. It's 16. So there's an example of where the Grievance Committee should have amended the complaint and deleted Article 1 and added 16. All right, so that, that's about adding articles. Yes? I'm going back to this. Variable Commission Agreement, talk to me on the break. We've already beat that horse to death a long time ago. <laughs> okay, so add articles, delete articles. You can cite standards of practice, like the one I gave you about not presenting an offer. You cite standard of practice 1-6. Now, if they're found in violation, what are they found in violation of? Article 1, not standard of practice 1-6, but 1-6 is cited. Okay. Making sure the proper parties are named. Now, and if you make any additions to the complaint, articles, parties, or any additions of any kind, you have to get the, the agreement of the complainant. What if the complainant says no? And by the way, complaints will say no. No, I'm fine with my complaint just the way it is. I'm not going to agree to your additions. Now what? You don't get to do the additions. It's, it's the complainant's complaint, it's not the grievance committee's. So then does it get tossed for being wrong? Pardon me? So then does it get tossed for being wrong? No, I'm saying that you, you've, added, that you've added a party like the broker. You might have added a different article or something like that. Or you might have read something in the complaint where it triggered uh, an additional charge that, that the complainant hadn't made. 
If you add anything to the complaint, you have to get the com complainant's approval. Well, what I'm saying, if they cite the wrong article and they don't agree to the change, then does it get... You can change the article. Yeah, no, that's okay. Changing the article is okay. Okay. But how about if you add articles? They have to have permission. Yeah, yes. Okay. All right. Now, we're going to next talk about the Grievance Committee proceeding on its own as the complainant. The Grievance Committee may proceed on its own as the complainant by direction of the Board of Directors, although usually the Board of Directors wouldn't be aware of whatever it is, or to, if you, uh, what I just talked about is if you add charges, you have to get the complainant's agreement. If the complainant says, no, I don't agree, then the Grievance Committee on those new charges could proceed as the complainant. Or, if the complainant is unable or unwilling to appear at the hearing, the grievance committee then can proceed as the complainant. Ha has anyone ever been involved in that where the grievance committee appears as the complainant? And then the members of the grievance committee said, but we're going to make a motion and vote and require you to go. <laughs> and I said, no, you're not. <laughs> I don't care what motion you make and how you vote, I'm not going to a hearing because I can't prove the case. Now, if you want to make the motion and one, of, and one of you wants to go before the hearing panel, that's fine, but I'm not going. All right, next thing I'm going to talk about is the use of a checklist. Danny, are you back there? And what I was going to say, and Danny is the new professional standards administrator, and any of this stuff that I have provided, uh, please feel free to use. And, and, and you know how to reach me, too, if you, if you ever have any questions or need help. Anyway, so what I've given you is a grievance committee checklist. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through it, but it uh, asks those questions. Is the complaint in the proper form? Does it name a person? Does it name articles, et cetera? If the person's a member, who the parties are. Summarize the allegations. And, and then it says, uh, 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 review the articles charged, standards of practice. Do any articles fit the allegations if proven true? Should articles be added? Should articles be deleted? And then to specify the allegations and the related article. Yes? Question on the articles. Because I've heard it both ways. When someone cites an article, are they, are they not supposed to cite the standard, the SOP that goes with it? Yes, no, citing the, citing the SOP is good. It's not only okay, it's good, but it's not required. But if the party charges an article and there is a pertinent standard of practice, the grievance committee can cite this, the standard of practice. They don't need the complainant's approval to cite the standard of practice because that's not adding anything to the complaint, like not presenting the offer. All right, the next, uh, the next thing you should have in your package is a grievance committee action form to use for the Grievance Committee to fill in and, and tell what action they took. Uh, those are just some uh, helpful forms. And, and actually, I need to give credit uh, to my wife. My wife, Alice, was the Executive Vice President of the Arizona Association of Realtors for 22 and a half years. One of her functions was Professional Standards Administrator. and. Uh, for the most part, she created all these forms I'm giving you, with her permission. <laughs> okay, use of a checklist, we, follow, we did that, it follows the manual, simplifies your task. All right, we're going to now do an ethics case on page five. And so you should have a case that says Grievance Committee Ethics Case Study. This time I'd like you to work in small groups and write, write at your table is fine. You, you two have, uh, some of you have very small groups. <laughs> but anyway, so in the ethics, th this is Grievance Committee Ethics Case Study, dealings w with another agent's client. Grievance Committee members, assume the complaint was timely filed, assume it w that the respondent's a member, identify the article or articles 
determine whether to dismiss or forward. So if you'll work in small groups and uh, again identify the, uh, identify the allegation, the article, and whether to forward or dismiss. So we'll take about 10 minutes to work on that. <laughs> Okay, what is the issue in this case? Compensation. What is it? Compensation. No, it's not compensation. It's whether or not she had the, whether or not she was violating anything by facilitating the purchase agreement being submitted directly. Okay, could everyone hear that? No. Yes. <laughs> yeah, one person said yeah and everyone else said no. But say, say that again. So whether she ha she was in violation or not of facilitating the writing of the purchase agreement directly. Okay. For the buyer. She she wrote the purchase agreement for a buyer who was represented exclusively by another realtor. That's the issue. What article applies? Sixteen thirteen. Sixteen, and you cited standard practice sixteen thirteen. Okay. And would you forward or dismiss? Dismiss. It says that um, the very last line, except with consent of the prospects exclusive representatives or at the direction of the prospects. The direction of the prospects. And if he directed her to fill out the purchase agreement, or yeah, he or she, whatever the pronoun is for the prospect, it, it, <laughs> yeah, she, then they. So what we don't know is if she just said, I'll do this for you, or he or she said. Darn, I was hoping you would say forward. <laughs> the Professional Standards Committee won't have anything to do now if you dismiss it. <laughs> well, if you, if you had the information to show that it was at the direction of the prospect, you absolutely have the right to dismiss it. But again, we're going to need an example for the Professional Standards Committee, so we'll let it go forward. <laughs> All right, let's take a 10 minute break. I think we know how it's going to end up. <laughs> okay, if you will turn to page 6 in your outline. We're going into the role of the Professional Standards Committee in ethics hearings. Role of Professional Standards Committee, once I get there. And, and actually, let, let me say this one thing, though, before I go to, I do want to talk about this one point. Do not breach confidentiality if you're on the Grievance Committee. You don't, don't get to discuss it with anyone else, except within the committee. Now, I can tell you that uh, when I was still in Bullhead City, I chaired the Professional Standards Committee five years in a row, and then I moved to Phoenix and uh, went into the Phoenix Committee and the, the State Committee. But uh, I was chair of the Professional Standards Committee for five years. During those five years, my partner was chair of the Grievance Committee. I can, I can assure you that we never once ever discussed anything about any of those cases, not even once. You have the obligation of confidentiality. Okay, role of directors and I mean professional standards committee and ethics complaints. Your job is to hold hearings. However, and I don't know if any of your associations have done this, <clears throat> you're actually not required to have a grievance committee anymore. The function of the grievance committee can be assigned to the Professional Standards Committee, panels of three or more. That's a, that's a fairly recent change to NAR policy. All right, page, anyway, but page six, the, the normal function of the Professional Standards Committee is to hold hearings, just like a trial. So you hold hearings, you, ex, you receive the evidence and testimony, ascertain the truth, apply, or, or require or apply the burden of proof, the standard of proof. The burden of proof is always on the complainant. The standard of proof is clear, strong, and convincing evidence. The complainant must prove 
their complaint with clear, strong, and convincing evidence. And then if you determine there was a violation, then you impose discipline, although what the manual says is recommend discipline to the board of directors. Now, this is also something that's fairly new. The respondent, within 20 days of receiving the complaint, being notified there's a complaint against them and receiving the complaint, the, the respondent can admit the violation and waive the hearing. So if they waive the hearing, and they admit, admit a violation, waive the hearing, the professional standards hearing panel still meets. You meet in executive session without any parties present and impose the discipline. That's, that's all you're doing is imposing the discipline from the allowed disciplines. All right, does that make sense? Do any of you do it that way? How many days? Within 20 days. Within 20 days after receiving the complaint, the, the respondent has the right to, to, in other words, opt out of the hearing. They have the right to admit the violation, sign the form, waive the hearing. All right, the composition of the Professional Standards Committee is an odd number, three or five. Always an odd number, so you don't have ties. And again, a maximum of one per firm. Now, you can have more than one person per firm on the Professional Standards Committee. You just can't have more than one person per firm serving on the, the same hearing panel. All right, before the hearing, there are some things to review, to go through, review the statements and the documents and the complaint. Don't, don't just show up to the hearing without knowing anything about it. Review the documents, review the charges, decide who's who. Uh, you can also check to see if it was timely filed. Also check to see if 21 days notice were given. Also verify that there's not more than one person per firm on the hearing panel. And the, these are things that maybe the, the chair will do. The staff could do some of them, the chair could do some of them. And again, do not discuss the issues out, outside, of, uh, outside of the hearing. And now, you, know, you, can, you can discuss or ask questions from uh, the professional standards administrator but don't start having discussions about it before the hearing. You're supposed to come there without having made any judgments. Although I'll admit that's hard to do. I've seen many times where I chaired hearings and after the conclusion of the hearing, the members of the hearing panel started saying, you know, I, I had already pretty much decided that the decision would go the other way. But after hearing the testimony here, then I've, I've changed my direction. All right, now with the hearing procedure, and there is a script that is provided for, for the hearing, and actually I was on the uh, interpretation subcommittee when those scripts were created and approved. And they, the reason they were created was to provide due process, to make sure we're providing due process rights to the parties. So follow the script exactly. And by doing so, you provide due process. All right, page seven, and actually the, that slide says appeal hearing. I'm not talking about an appeal hearing. I'm talking about the actual hearing by the Professional Standards Committee. So if you follow this, the script, these are the steps. The first one is the, the chair reads the opening statement from the script, then introductions of everyone who's there, parties, witnesses, hearing panel, uh, court reporter if there is one, professional standards administrator if he or she is there. So everyone gets introduced. Then you have the apart, the all, all parties and witnesses affirm to tell the truth. Also if you have counsel, legal counsel, uh, what legal counsel is allowed to do is make an opening statement they can under direct examination question their client. They get to cross-examine the other party and the other party's witnesses. They get to make a closing statement, but they do not get to testify 
and they don't get to answer questions. The, the parties must answer the questions from the other party or from the hearing panel. <clears throat> Sometimes attorneys will say they want to testify. Well, they can testify, but they also have to affirm just like anyone else who testifies. And they'll tell you, no, I don't have to, to do that, I'm an attorney. Well, yes, you do have to do it if you want to testify. And that means that you might at some point in the hearing have to do the affirmation solely with the attorney because in a lot of cases they'll just bring that up all of a sudden. But anyway, so at this point you excuse the witnesses and then the complainant presents their case. And the complainant's case includes the witnesses. The complainant's case is not over until the complainant says it's over. That, that means they can make an opening statement. They can call their witnesses if they have any one at a time. And then they get to continue on and present their case. But at, 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 this, uh, at this time is where a lot of hearing panels go astray. Hearing panels start asking questions before the parties had any opportunity to, to say much and they never get to present their case. Or the other thing that, happen, that happens is the hearing panel members will ask questions of the witness and then not, they don't let the complainant finish presenting their case. Again, their case isn't over until they say it's over. And if they have multiple witnesses, it goes through this process. All right, so the, the respondent has the right to cross-examine. And if there are multiple witnesses, they have the right to cross-examine the witnesses and the complainant. And the cross-examination of the complainant is last. And I've, that one's ha I've seen that happen a lot too, where before the complainant calls any witnesses, if they have witnesses, the, the hearing panel chair allows the other party to cross-examine the complainant and allows the hearing panel members to question the complainant. Well, they're not through with their case yet. You have to let them finish their case. All right, then we go into cross-examination, and here's the next point where the hearing goes astray. Cross-examination is simply this. The respondent asking the complainant questions to, to uh, uh, have them say something that might work against them, to try to prove something. It's the respondent asking questions and the complainant answering those questions. But here's what happens in real life in hearings. The complainant says something in the response that the respondent disagrees with, so the respondent starts arguing with the complainant and now they're arguing back and forth. If you're chairing the hearing, don't allow that. No matter how many times you have to explain it. No, this is you asking questions and you answering. Period. Keep them to that process. And that, that includes uh, with the witnesses. All right, and then questions by the hearing panel. If you're the hearing panel chair, follow the script exactly. And there's a point in the script where it says questions by the hearing panel. Don't let hearing panel members start asking questions until you give them the instruction to ask questions. Because what happens is it gets the complainant off track and they don't ever end up presenting their case. And in that circumstance, ask questions of the complainant only. The complainant's the only one who has testified. The respondent will probably, if you start asking questions of the respondent, you're probably going to ask questions of stuff they were going to say anyway. So at this point, question the complainant only. All right, then the parties reverse roles, and it's exactly the same process. Resp uh, respondent presents their case and witnesses, cross-examination by complainant, questions by hearing panel. And at this point, it's okay for the hearing panel to question both parties. All right, then there's a closing. How many closings do the parties get to make? One each. One each. But here's what happens in hearings. Complainant makes a closing statement, the respondent makes their closing statement, and now the complainant wants to rebut what the respondent said. They don't get to. 
There's one closing statement each, and for you to allow the complainant to rebut the respondent's closing statement is a, is a violation of due process. So what I always have done in those hearings is tell the complainant before they start their closing, this is your opportunity to make a closing statement, to say whatever you want to to complete the record, and keep in mind, this is your only opportunity to speak, so say whatever it is you want us to hear, you will not get to come back and rebut the respondent's closing later. So hold them to one closing statement each. And then the fair hear, uh, hearing questions are asked. Do each of you feel this hearing was conducted fairly? Do each of you feel you were giving ad given adequate opportunity to testify, present evidence and witnesses and conduct cross-examination? And what are we hoping they'll say? Yes. <laughs> yes. What if they don't say yes? Well, you can ask them, okay, well, uh, why do you not feel? And, and actually, for, for the most part, it's they don't understand the questions. They're not listening to the questions. And what I've done many times when the party said no is, well, I ask them why. Well, because I don't like what he said. And I'll go back and let, let me let me ask you these questions again. Now, this is what I ask you. Do you feel that I conducted this hearing fairly? Oh, well, yeah, you, you conducted the hearing fairly. And then, do you feel that I gave you adequate opportunity to testify, present evidence and witnesses, and conduct cross-examination. Well, yeah, you, you did that too. Okay, so you now have yes to both fair he uh, hearing questions. But what if, they, what if their answer is no? They get to say no. And they can state for the record why if they want to. And don't do like I saw happen with one hearing panel where they wouldn't let the parties leave until they said yes, the hearing was conducted fairly. <laughs> if, they, if their answer is no, their answer is no. And then you adjourn the hearing. All right, does that make sense? Any questions on what we just went through? Question. Yes, question. So say one of them says no, they didn't feel like it was fair, and you adjourn it. What is their next process? They have the right to file an appeal. And if it goes to the appeal, they'll state their, their reason. And then if you're the hearing panel chair, you'll go to the appeal and rebut what they say. Yeah. And, and as far as the, the party saying no, again, that's their right. But the other thing is a lot of times the parties will say, yes, the hearing was conducted fairly. But then they'll file a, 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 an appeal based on procedural error saying the hearing wasn't conducted fairly. And so the hearing panel chair will say, well, they said the hearing was conducted fairly. Well, that doesn't matter. They don't want to alienate the hearing panel. So most of the time they'll say yes, <laughs> even if they mean no. <laughs> wow. Okay, continuing on. Who can attend, and this is in the way of counsel. I already talked about the parties can have legal counsel and they can have realtor, realtor counsel and the roles, the roles of, of counsel. Also the association's attorney may attend. Now th this is something that was very common. When I was involved in a hearing at the Arizona Association of Realtors, not where I was chairing it, but where I was there in some other capacity, like if I was there as a party or I was there as an expert witness. They always brought legal counsel. I don't know what they thought they were going to accomplish by having legal counsel there, but they always did. But here's the thing about legal counsel. You can have your association counsel attend, but they are there for procedural guidance only. They can give the hearing panel procedural advice, legal advice, but they cannot participate in the hearing. For example, and I have seen uh, attorneys attempt to do this, uh, counsel for the association, start trying to question the parties. They're there to advise the hearing panel only. They cannot participate in the hearing or the executive session. Now legal counsel can attend the executive session and they can give legal advice, they can give procedural advice, but they cannot participate 
and, and reaching the decision. All right, executive session. When you're in executive session as a hearing panel, you need to get focus back on the issues. Uh, typically through hearings, you will have listened to a lot of stuff that uh, uh, had absolutely nothing to do with the charges. So you need to get focused back on the issues. And again, the burden of proof is, uh, the standard of proof is clear, strong, and convincing proof. It says, if the hearing panel finds a violation, the co uh, no, Have, after conducting a hearing, the hearing panel decides whether there was a violation of the code of ethics proven by clear, strong, and convincing proof. It's up to the complainant to prove their case, not you as the hearing panel members to investigate through the hearing. It's the party's requirement to prove their case. The respondent doesn't even have to say anything if they don't want to. It's up to the complainant to, to prove their complaint. All right, in reaching the decision, don't overinterpret. I said something about this a little bit before. Sometimes people say to me, well, Don, I'm not interpreting that the way you are. Here's my question, why are you interpreting it? Why don't you just read it? It says exactly what it means. Don't interpret the code of ethics. Read it, apply it. All right, so it's not what we do in my office. I've heard that one many times from hearing panel members. Well, that's not what we do in my office. Or, Don, that's not what you or I would have done. Well, all that stuff's irrelevant. The issue is, did their conduct violate the code of ethics? And in reaching the decision, it's not about perfection. They don't have to be perfect. The question is, did they violate the written word of the code of ethics or not? And it's not what you think happened. Because I hear that one all the time in hearings. Well, what I think happened is, doesn't matter what you think happened. It's what you know happened, as proven by the complainant. And in writing the facts, I'm going to move ahead here shortly because we're, we're cutting out some of the time of the class and I'm going to get you out of here, but uh, in writing the facts, list only relevant facts determined by having been proven by clear, strong, and convincing proof. The measured degree of proof which will produce a firm belief or conviction as to the allegations sought to be established. And, and here's a, a chart that shows the steps in the due process process. Notice that uh, here's the preponderance of the evidence. That's the, 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 that's the burden of proof we use in arbitration. Look where clear, strong, and convincing is. It's the next to the top step. The top one is beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the standard of proof in a criminal trial. All right, so you determine what happened. State the facts sequentially. Make them clear and concise. Have them make sense later and relevant to the charges and the conclusions. And poor decision writing, uh, making statements that are not facts. For example, so-and-so alleged. Well, of course they alleged, that's their complaint. Doesn't matter what they alleged, it only matters what they proved. Or so-and-so testified. Well, that's not a fact. The fact was proven by clear, strong, and convincing proof. Or unnecessary or relevant statements like evidence and testimony showed. Just write it simply as a fact. Stating an opinion as a fact, writing inappropriate discipline. And, and then state if, it's, if there's a violation or not. Let me get back to that slide. Which respondent violated the code of ethics? Which respondent didn't? Or, did, or which article or articles did they violate? And then you uh, cite the article and the basis of the article. Now, once you determine there's a violation, you can then and only then look in the member's file and see if they have previous violations. 
And then you can uh, use a previous violation as the basis for determining the discipline. And, and use good judgment. Make the, make the punishment fit the crime. Sometimes hearing panels have a tendency to overpunish. Remember that one I talked about where, no, actually I'm going to give you a different one. So the realtor was found in violation. The clients wanted him to cancel the listing. What he said was, I'm not going to cancel the listing, but I will remove it from MLS. But I need your written instruction and approval to remove it from MLS. So he sent them the form to sign. They didn't sign the form. But a few days later called the office and said, we want to know why our listing hasn't been canceled. So the branch manager of the office went into MLS and put it on to temporarily off the market status. The agent didn't do it. The branch manager did. So the, the sellers filed a complaint against the agent and what they alleged in their complaint was he didn't provide them copies of all documents. Well, the hearing panel found him in violation for not having written approval to put the property temporarily off the market. Well, to start with, that wasn't even a charge in their complaint, so that was improper of the hearing panel. But secondly, they refused to return the, the form to be able to take it off the market, and thirdly, he's not even the one who took it from MLS. The branch manager did without even telling him. But the hearing panel found him in violation. Well, even if you consider it a violation, that's a very minor uh, violation at worst. But uh, the, the uh, decision of the hearing panel was he had to, he got a letter of, of warning, had to attend uh, CE, that's okay, but they also fined him $250. Now for that circumstance, that's excessive. Not to mention it was a bad decision to start with. All right, so make the punishment fit the crime. And sometimes in professional standards, there are a lot of members who have a hang -em mentality. All right, so common problems, violations not charged, what we do in my office, that's not what you or I would have done, and what they think should have been done. Expecting perfection. Oh, and one other thing I want to talk about in this area is, I, I've heard this one a lot. Well, they did something wrong. We can't just let them get away with it. Well, the only thing we're considering in our process is, did they violate the code of ethics? And sometimes it's not a violation of the code of ethics. It might be a violation of the Nebraska Real Estate Commission's rules, for example but doesn't violate anything in the code of ethics in the comments, but we can't just let them get away with it. Well, we don't have any choice. We can only find them in violation of the code of ethics. So if it's a violation of the, com of the commission's rules, what do we do? What did you say? Send it to the commission. You can only do that uh, based on approval of the board. Of, the board of directors only has the authority to send it to the real estate commission. The answer is probably nothing. But remember, you're only determining if there's a violation of the code of ethics. And the, 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 this uh, item I said once before, and I hear this where they violated the spirit of the code. There's no spirit of the code. There's only the letter of the code, what it says in writing. Got it. All right, now I want to go through the discipline. What was that? Got it. <laughs> now, what I want to do is go through the discipline, and then we'll go back and revisit that case. Uh, so these are the disciplines, letter of warning or reprimand. Letter of warning says, you've been found in violation, this is a warning, future violations may result in stronger sanctions. Letter of reprimand is a little bit stronger letter. It adds, this is to be considered an official reprimand. <clears throat> the respondent found in violation can be required to attend education, like a class on the code of ethics and maybe a class on agency. They also can be fined up to $15,000. 
they, they can. Let me skip past that probation. Uh, they can be suspended from membership for 30 days to a year, which also could include uh, uh, w uh, removal of MLS privileges, or they can be expelled from membership for one to three years, including rights to MLS. Those are the disciplines may, we may impose, and, and those are the only ones. And normally we'll do more than one. There's always a letter. Normally there will be education. There might be a fine. We don't usually see suspension or expulsion unless it's repeat violations or something really serious, like one of those violations of public trust I talked about. Yes? Pardon me? It seems to me that if you're expelled from membership, then you're not going to be able to be with your broker because of the trilateral agreement with the you know, local, state, and national. And they would think that you would then be off the MLS because you can be with your broker. Okay, and, and that, that makes sense. However, the broker, uh, that's up to the broker to decide whether they want to let that person stay there or not. If they got expelled from membership only, they would still have rights to MLS. Now, it's a broker's decision. This, remember, this has no effect on your license. That's, that's the Nebraska Real Estate Commission. You, you, you couldn't be a member of the broker. You couldn't, be, you couldn't be with the broker if you weren't a realtor because of the agreement. And then you couldn't be with the broker if you weren't a member of the MLS because all people in the broker firm have to be a member of the MLS. I don't understand what you could have. Well, there, there, there's no requirement that you have to be a member. NAR doesn't have any such policy. What NAR does have, though, is a dues formula that says the realtor broker will be charged dues based on the total number of licensees with that company. NAR cannot have a policy that requires all licensees to be realtors. That would be an antitrust violation. So on... And, and actually, let me go through a couple of, of uh, items here. In your handout, you should have one that says do's and don'ts for hearing panel members. Mm -hmm. Some tips I'm going to leave with you for things to, to, especially the ones to not say. And the next one is the 17 deadly sins of ethics hearing panels. Then you have a form, should have a page that shows recommended discipline. Then you should have, and I, don't, I won't have time to go through this, but what I created was a pre-hearing meeting checklist. When you hold your hearings, do you have pre-hearing meetings with the hearing panel? You should, to go back and review. And, and I've given you a handout to use in that circumstance. If you just look at the, the bold headings, always hold a pre-hearing meeting. Focus the hearing panel members on the issues. Compare the allegations to the code of ethics. Cover the role of hearing panel members. Handle potential procedural issues, like attorneys uh, that weren't uh, notice provided for or parties who show up without notice. Cover the role of alternates, if any. Do you use alternates in your hearings? Who knows? Do you use alternates in your hearings? The, the uh, NAR allows using alternates, but it also says they have to <laughs> sit off over to the side somewhere on their own and they're not allowed to participate. But if you have an alternate and someone has to leave the hearing because of an emergency, you now have someone who can fill in as long as they're there the entire hearing. So there's something there about use of alternates and pre-hearing meeting. All right, then let's find that case that we started with. And, and actually, you've already, you've already read through most of it. So let's just take a couple of minutes for you to read through this. Professional Standards Committee Ethics Case Study, dealing with another agent's client. Take a couple of minutes to go through it, and then, and then we'll discuss it. Professional Standards Committee Ethics Case Study, dealings with another agent's client. Everyone ready? Anyone not ready? Anyone not ready who wants to be ready? 
Okay, Let, let's go through it. And actually this won't take us long. It's almost the same as what you reviewed before. There's only one, well, a little bit was added. And it says, if the hearing panel accepts April's testimony to be the truth, should April be found in violation of the Code of Ethics? We already know what the situation is, interference with agency. We already know it's Article 16. Someone, someone already uh, here cited standard of practice, I mean, uh, yeah, standard of practice 1613. It also happens to be case interpretation 1614. So, what do you say? No, no, no violation. No violation. And actually this is an exceptional group because uh, a lot of the groups say it's a violation despite the fact that the Code of Ethics says it isn't. <laughs> and, and you are supposed to go by the Code of Ethics. So good job on that one. It's not a violation and it's, it's, it's uh, standard of practice 1613 that says, that for property exclusively listed or buyers subject to an exclusive agreement, all dealing shall be done through their agent unless you have the consent of their agent or at the direction of the, of the party. Well, this is at the direction of the party. All right, I am going to, pardon me. The only concern, I go back to what I said, was permission. His what? Oh, there, there could be a, there could be a commission issue, and guess what? Okay. Commission? Yeah. Oh, and and guess what? We are going to look at it here shortly from a different perspective, the perspective of the commission. All right, and I'm going to skip ahead. Um, I'm going to go ahead to the role of the grievance committee in arbitration. All right, role of grievance committee in arbitration. And this will be Page 13 in your outline. Page 13 in your outline. Money, money, who gets the money? All right, so consideration of an arbitration request, it's the same thing, must be reviewed within 45 days. And again, determine if it's in proper form, if the necessary parties are named. And with necessary parties in, in an arbitration, the principal brokers must be the parties. You have to have the principal broker on the filing side, the principal broker on the respondent side. So proper parties, principal brokers, also to verify that it was filed within 180 days of closing or, uh, uh, or within discovery. 180 days of closing or discovery, whichever is later. And also if and now, for arbitration, it says to determine if the respondent is or was a member. Is a member or was a member at the time of the, the circumstances, the transaction. Also, is litigation pending, and this is talking about civil litigation, a lawsuit pending out of the same transaction, same set of circumstances. Also, can an impartial panel be appointed? Is it arbitrable? And is it mandatory or voluntary? All right, let me go back to the one about litigation pending. And I, I said civil litigation pending out of the same transaction, same set of circumstances. If you're the grievance committee, what must you do? You must hold it in abeyance. Now probably the court's going to tell the, whoever filed the lawsuit, the plaintiff, to go back to the realtor association and arbitrate. But at any rate, you cannot arbitrate it unless and until it gets released from the court. If the court litigates it, you can never arbitrate it. The obligation is to arbitrate, but if it ends up in court, the court takes jurisdiction over our process. All right, so these are the grievance committee considerations. 
did it close if it's a procuring cause dispute? How would you know if it closed if you're the grievance committee? Uh, Lake should have applied for as supporting documents should have given uh, something from the MLS. Yeah, yeah. The, the uh, complainant filing the arbitration request should provide a copy of the MLS printout showing it closed. That's all they need to provide for that proof. All right, the next one is, is the, matter, uh, re is the amount requested too small or too large? And that's your determination as a grievance committee. I remember a complaint, that the arbitration request that was filed and they were requesting to be paid a dollar ninety-nine. What? <laughs> what was that? They just wanted to make a point. Yeah, they wanted to make a point. So what did they say? It's not the money, it's the principle. principle. We don't arbitrate principle, we arbitrate money. Doesn't it cost $500 to open up there? Yeah, it's a $500 deposit. So the person puts up a $500 deposit to maybe get $1.99. And if they lose the arbitration, they lose their $500. In addition to not getting the $1.99. <laughs> now, as far as the amount requested too large, I've seen arbitrations where the commission amounts were as much as $250,000 or $300,000. Now, I said commission. Not sales price, <laughs> commission. Well, the association has the right to say that they think the amount requested is too large. In fact, I remember with the Arizona Association of Realtors, this panel of so-called experts recommended that for any arbitration amount over 25,000, it should be dismissed as the amount being too large. And I said, that's nonsense. The issues are the same. It doesn't matter how much money it is. The issues are always the same. And I remember once I was testifying in court over a, a this was over a commercial transaction and the commission in dispute was 480,000. And the lawyer in cross-examination asked me, "Mr. Martin, how many commercial transactions did you do last year?" I said, "None." "How many did you do the year before?" "None." How many did you do the year before that? None. Well, when's the last time you did a commercial transaction? I said, probably about 1997. He said, you haven't done a commercial transaction since 1997, and you think you're qualified to sit here as an expert and, and tell this jury what they should decide? And I said, it's irrelevant that it's a commercial transaction. This isn't about a commercial transaction, it's about a commission dispute. And the issues are the same, regardless of what type of transaction it is. This one just happens to be a commercial transaction. Well, it's the same thing for the amount requested, too large. That, that was the opinion I voiced. It doesn't matter, They're all, the issues are all the same. So that idea didn't fly, about 25,000. Oh, and the uh, person I was uh, an expert witness for won the four hundred and eighty thousand dollars. The attorney took sixty percent of it? I'm not I don't know how much the attorney took. The question is did the attorney take sixty percent? I don't think they took sixty percent, but the the way the, the that the attorney on on the side I was representing uh, they j they blew the whole process all the way through and the other attorney on the other side had no uh, didn't have the the smarts or whatever to object. They, they should have objected to my testimony period because I didn't provide any statements. I never got deposed. So w when it came to the person winning $480,000, all they owed me for was the court time. So I got about $1,000 of it. But anyway, so too large. The next one says if the matter is too legally complex, if we decide the matter is too legally complex, like uh, the example I use for this one, a realtor who was a property manager left a company, he was handling about 600 property management accounts, changed companies, wrote letters to all those property owners uh, soliciting their accounts. About a third of them, uh, about a third of them went with him about a third of them stayed with the other company, and about a third of them said, we don't want anything to do with either one of you. This was handled so unprofessionally. 
So anyway, the, the uh, company the broker filed an arbitration request and what they wanted us to do as a hearing panel was determine how much property management income they would lose over the next five years, their best guess being that it would take five years to uh, build back up to the same property management level. So they wanted us to figure out how much money they were going to lose over the next five years and award it to them. <coughs> So, in other words, to take our crystal ball and look ahead into the future. Anyway, one of the things they didn't do was request an amount on the arbitration form. You're required to request an amount, 5,000, 10,000, 25,000, whatever it is. They didn't do that. So, from the professional standards uh, uh, staff, a letter was sent to them saying you have to specify an amount and from their legal counsel, the response came back that it's too complicated. We want you to figure out the amount. We said if it's too complicated for, for you, it's too complicated for us. And you have the right to go to court if you choose to, but your arbitration request is dismissed. Also, if there are sufficient number of arbitrators. All right, continuing on to page 14. If the complaint is not in the proper form, proper parties, litigation pending, uh, I think I just said this, if litigation is, yeah, I did say it, if litigation is pending, we can't arbitrate it. Can an impartial panel be provided if there are enough arbitrators? And if it's a procuring cause case, did it close? And we already went through the part about how, you, how proof would be provided that it closed. Also, was it filed within 180 days? If the respondent is or, or was a member? If it was already litigated, not arbitrable, too large, small, complex, I already went through all of those. But the other one is a procuring cause case where there's no possibility of it closing, then it must be dismissed. All right, and if the allegations are taken true on their face, is the matter at issue related to a real estate transaction? And is it properly arbitral? Is there a basis upon which the award could be based? All right, so let's look at that. If the facts alleged in the request is taken as true on their face, then is the matter real estate related and some basis upon which the award can be based? Well, it's easy to tell if it's real estate related, but what's the basis for determining if it's arbitrable? Well, the basis is if there was a promise to pay. So we have a dispute arising out of a real estate transaction and it's a controversy. Contractual matter must be involved and the dispute may be, be between realtors, realtor and client, realtor and customers. All right, so contractual disputes where there was a promise to pay. If there was not a promise to pay, it wasn't arbitrable. All right, so where would there be a promise to pay, for example? MLS. MLS. So you have a promise to pay an MLS, an offer to compensate, and then you have a dispute out of that transaction between the listing broker and a cooperating broker, where a promise to pay was made through MLS. So that's arbitrable. Or <clears throat> the promise to pay was made through MLS by the listing broker, and you have two cooperating brokers. D disputing the commission. And so when the party files a, an arbitration request, how do they prove there was a promise to pay? Provide the MLS. Yeah, usually it's to provide a copy of the MLS printout. So they can prove there was a promise to pay with an MLS printout. They can also prove it closed with an MLS printout. Also a dispute between a seller and broker out of a listing. Also a dispute between a buyer and a broker out of a buyer-broker agreement. Dispute between client and customer where there was a specific promise to pay and an intra-office dispute. Intra-office dispute is two different realtors in the same company. And that would be based on company policy. The, the broker might have a policy that the broker will handle it. 
whatever the broker's policy was. My policy was that I would resolve the dispute if the two agents wanted me to, or I would mediate it if they wanted me to, or they could go to the Arizona Association of Realtors and have the association arbitrate it as long as they voluntarily agreed. All right, let's go to page 15. And we're going to go through some short examples. And actually, somehow I skipped right past this. I want to go through this with you. That case we worked, decision of ethics hearing panel, you have this in your handout, but this is, this is the way a, a decision should be written. The complaint was filed June 1st, 2017. The complainant was Cal Gone. The respondent was April Rainey. Findings of fact. The basis for our decision is the conclusion of the hearing panel as to the following facts. Complainant Cal Gone was the exclusive agent of the buyer of the subject property. Respondent April Rainey was the listing agent of the subject property. The buyer, C Sharp Minor, attended an open house the respondent was conducting on her listing the subject property. <coughs> Excuse me, the buyer disclosed to the respondent that he was exclusively represented by another agent. The respondent then showed the buyer through the home after disclosing she and her broker represented the seller, not the buyer. The buyer indicated he had pressing business travel plans, was seriously interested in the property, and requested the respondent's assistant in preparing a purchase offer. The respondent assisted the buyer in filling out a standard form purchase contract. The respondent presented the offer to purchase to the seller who accepted it. All right, so those are the facts. This is the decision. Conclusions of the hearing panel. We, the members of the hearing panel, in the above stated case, find the respondent, April Rainey, not in violation of Article 16 of the Code of Ethics. We further find the facts do not support a violation of the article charged. Recommendation for disciplinary action. We recommend to the association the following action. Not applicable. You say that's a nursing home? It's in, it's in your packet, yes. And then right following that, there's something in there about, about writing decisions. It's not in there. It's not in there. Uh -uh. Nope. Or something that's similar. Similar. Decision of the yeah, that's it. Decision of Ethics Hearing Panel. Decision of Ethics Hearing Panel. Different wording. Yeah, yeah. It's not the same. How could it be different wording? This is what I gave them. <laughs> oh, that's a different. All right, let me see something here. Professional standard. It's the case study. Let's go a little bit past that. Executive session, arbitration, it's not in there, apparently. But anyway, let's do the, find the one at the top that says arbitration quiz. Arbitration quiz. Assume the complaint was timely filed unless specific dates are provided. Assume that all subject properties were MLS listings. Determine whether to dismiss or forward the complaint. Assume the proper parties are named. That all responsible brokers are named. And you do have enough information. All right, so this is like the one we did before. This morning, some of you weren't here this morning though. Can I get someone to volunteer to read to us example one, and then we'll decide if we're going to dismiss it or forward it. Okay? Uh, buyers entered into a contract through Biff Levy, their buyer's agent, on a property offered in MLS. Biff did all the follow-up work and processing, and the buyers qualified for their loan. Everything was done except for signing documents, funding, and closing. The seller suddenly decided not to go through with the sale. The listing agent, Elota Manure, 
<laughs> told Biff of the seller's decision and explained there was nothing further Aloda could do about it. Biff then filed for arbitration against Aloda, claiming that he, Biff, had performed as procuring cause. Okay, so what do you think? Uh, forward or dismiss? We're doing a procuring cause, but... What did you say? I said it didn't close. Didn't close. I'd say forward. Can it close? Doesn't Is there any possibility of closing? No. no. So what do you do? Dismiss it. Dismiss it. An arbitration for procuring cause can only be held if it closes. This one can never close. It wasn't nice, but it didn't close. All right. The agent should sue that seller for commission. The agent should sue the seller. No, the agent can't sue the seller for commission because the buyer's agent didn't have a contractual relationship with the seller. The agent can. The, the listing agent could, yes, but that doesn't help the buyer's agent. Okay, number two, who will volunteer to do number two? Right here, yes. Bunny and Bubby Raspberry filed an arbitration request against their listing agent, Honor Fell, on November 10, 2017, alleging they were damaged because Honor had them underpriced their listing, which closed on April 30th, 2017. Mr. and Mrs. Raspberry stated that they didn't discover until October 30th, 2017, that comparable sales in Naples were available at the time of entering into their listing agreement that showed the property to be worth $15,000 more than it actually sold for. They further claimed Honor didn't present those comparable sales to Mr. and Mrs. Raspberry prior to the listing agreement being signed. All right, what do you think on this one? No. Oh, what was that? Too late. Too late because? It, actually, it was 183 days. And in, in, this, uh, in this case, again, it's 180 days, not 183. 183 day, 180 days after closing or discovery, whichever is later. All right, so, but what if it had been timely filed? Then what? Dismiss. Dismiss because? There's no contractual agreement that they have to provide the comps. Yeah, there's no contractual agreement. I mean, when you take a listing, do you write in the listing, if it turns out that I gave you the wrong comps, I'm going to pay you the difference? No, there's no contractual basis. And what NAR has said is that parties cannot arbitrate against a realtor for damages. This is a claim of damages. There was no promise to pay. Good job. All right, uh, number three, who will volunteer to do number three? Anyone, number three. Number three is short and sweet. Yes. Neil Down, a quantity cooperating agent, filed an arbitration request against neighbor acquaintance, Mr. Hayes, and cooperating broker, Mr. Hayes, based on Neil's opinion that he, not major, was a procuring cause of the sale of the subject to another property. Okay, what do you think? Forward because? It closed and... It, it closed and? A procuring cost. And, and I already said in the instructions, assume it was an MLS listing, so compensation was offered. Two requirements, compensation offered and did it close. So that would be forwarded as an arbitration. Number, who'll do number four? Uh, Beverly Hillbilly, or Hillby, the buyer's agent for the sale of <laughs> property in a bank-owned property sale, has filed an arbitration against uh, Nancy and Beyonce? Chancy. Chancy, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> the listing agent. To support her claim, Lana uh, has submitted a copy of the MLS printout of the same date as the contract date showing the compensation offered to buyer's agent and a copy of the settlement statement showing that Lana's broker was actually paid three or three dollars less than the amount offered through MLS due to the seller's refusal to pay compensation on the amount of concessions provided by the seller. Okay, what do you think on this one? Pardon me? What would you What would you do on this one? Is there a typo in there? Yeah. 
Okay, but what, what would you do with the arbitration request as a grievance committee? I would forward it. Forward it. Forward it. And actually it's standard of practice 3-2 that the, that the listing broker only has the right to change the offer of compensation until the offer has been presented, not after they're already in a contract. And this is what a lot of banks did. But the listing agent is still the one who's responsible. And while the bank might reduce the commission, the bank doesn't have the right to reduce the other broker's commission. Only their own broker's commission if their own broker agrees to it. So it is arbitrable. The amount is $330. No, but here's a consideration that you, that you can make as a grievance committee. Do you think $330 is too small an amount to arbitrate. You could make that, that determination, but, but otherwise it is arbitrable. And who will do number five for us? One more. Number five. Go ahead, yes. Angel Gabrielle Horn has filed an arbitration in Cook. Angel claims that near the expiration of her listing on the subject property, Okay, what do you think on this one? Forward. Forward? How many say forward? How many say dismiss? Okay, more said forward. What's the issue? What's the issue of this one? It was procured during contract. Isn't it a dispute over a listing commission? Can the Realtor Association arbitrate a dispute over a listing commission? No. There's no promise to pay. There's no promise to pay between the brokers. It's, it's, there's, there's nothing about listing commissions in MLS. So that is not arbitrable. Okay. Remember the examples I gave you? Dispute between brokers, seller and broker, and customer and broker. But not between two brokers over a listing commission. All right, what I want to do next is turn to page 15. 15. Uh, find, go back through your stack of stuff there further and find the document that says Grievance Committee Procuring Cause Example. Grievance Committee Procuring Cause Example. Next to, page. Next to last page, okay. Grievance committee procuring cause example. All right, who will volunteer to, to read this one for us? This is a long one. It's going to take a lot of breath. <laughs> who will volunteer? Okay. Th and thank you. Uh, Realtor Autumn Fall and her broker filed an arbitration request against listing agent Realtor Corey Dunnett and his broker. Autumn stated that her client, Holly Woods, while attending an open house held by Corey, stated she was working with another realtor, that she was in fact exclusively represented by another realtor, and handed Corey Autumn's business card. Holly went on to explain that she was very familiar with the home because a close personal friend had owned the home at one time. Corey then said he would be very happy to show Holly through the home and answer any questions she might have, and after explaining, he represented the seller, not the buyer, Corey did show Holly through the home and answered her questions. After seeing the home, Holly expressed serious interest in buying the home and told Corey that she would have Autumn prepare an offer to purchase and deliver it to Corey. At that point, Corey told Holly there was a lot of interest in the home. He was expecting multiple offers at any time and suggested if Holly didn't want to lose out, she should sign an offer to purchase immediately. 
Holly didn't want to lose out on the home, so she agreed. Corey did prepare the offer to purchase. Holly signed it. Corey presented the offer to the seller, and the seller accepted it. Okay, thank you. Good job. Excellent. All right, so is this real estate related? Yes. Was there a promise to pay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Did it close? Mm -hmm. Well, we're not sure if it closed, yeah, true. but you, you as agreements committee make sure it closed. But assuming it, it closed, what do you do? You just said it's real estate related. You just said there was a promise to pay. You just said it closed. So what do you do? Forward. Forward. See, it's that simple. That, your role is that simple. Because we're grievance. Pardon me? Why do we forward when we didn't forward the last one? Because the last one was about ethics. This one's about arbitration, which is money. Oh, commission you. dispute. Yeah. It's now a commission dispute. It's now a commission dispute. Thank Same you. transaction. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to jump ahead again. We're going to now go through that case study with the rest of it as a professional standards committee. And, and actually your role in, in professional standards uh, arbitration hearings is exactly the same as in the Code of Ethics, except now you're determining who's entitled to the commission and the standards preponderance of the evidence. So uh, let me find that one. And this should be the last page. Last page. All right, so you have, you have the same case. All right, it says, so in the middle, this case study to the, the case study to this point is the same as already reviewed by the grievance committee. Now change the facts as follows. Scenario two, after seeing the home, Holly expressed serious interest in buying the home but also told Corey she had pressing business plans and wanted Corey to prepare an offer to purchase. Corey did prepare the offer to purchase. Holly signed it. Corey presented the offer to the seller and the seller accepted it. What you're determining is who is the procuring cause and therefore gets the commission that was offered through MLS. You're not dealing with the listing commission at all. Sometimes members say, but he already got the listing commission. Well, that's irrelevant. The dispute is over the commission offered through MLS. And the question is, who procured the buyer? Corey. Corey. Corey? Does everyone agree, Corey? Except exclusive agency. Except what? Except exclusive agency? Well, yeah, there's an exclusive agency, but the question is, who procured the buyer? Procuring because yes. to me, I think of procuring cause as the reason the person first saw the home. So if they found the open house on Zillow, you couldn't really say <coughs> that her exclusive agent was the reason she found the home. But if her agent had said, go to this open house, I would consider her as the procuring cause. Okay, but that, uh, that's not procuring cause. It's not the one responsible for them first seeing it. It's who's responsible for them making the decision to buy it. And in this case, the agent didn't say go there anyway, that I can see. That's, yeah, where I was at. Yeah. All right, so procuring cause. Let me give you a couple of things on procuring cause. These are, these are legal definitions as established by state supreme courts. This is the state supreme court of Arkansas. The procuring cause is the squirrel that shakes the branch, not the one that gathers the nuts. Well, in this example, who shook the branch? Corey shook the branch. Oh, and he also gathered the nuts. So that one's clear. All right, but now let's, let's look at, let's, in scenario two, what if Holly had then gone back to Autumn and had Autumn prepare the offer instead of having Corey prepare it? Who then would be the procuring cause? Oh, what if Holly, yeah, what if Holly, Holly's the buyer? What if Holly had gone back to Autumn? Who would be the procuring cause? Still well, still the same question. Who procured the buyer? Autumn didn't procure the buyer by writing the offer. Who procured them? Corey. Corey, Corey procured the buyer. Who shook the branch? In, in changing the circumstances, Holly went back to Autumn. Who shook the branch? Corey, Corey. Corey shook the branch. Who gathered the nuts? 
Autumn. Autumn. The procuring cause is the one who shakes the branch, not the one who gathers the nuts. Or as the Missouri Supreme Court said, the procuring cause is the broker who shakes the tree, not the one who runs up and gathers the apples. So who shook the tree? Corey. Corey, who ran up and gathered the, the apples in the second scenario. Uh -huh. Autumn did. So either way you look at it, uh, Corey is the procuring cause of that transaction. Okay, procuring cause. Whoever walks them over the threshold? No, not who walks them over the threshold. Threshold's not an issue. Who writes the contract's not an issue. It's who does the things that were most, uh, that, that did the most to motivate the buyer to buy the property. Now in the example we just gave, Autumn wasn't even involved in it. So at the time of writing the offer is after they've already been procured. Don't, don't buyers make a decision to buy the property before they have an offer prepared? So who's responsible for them making the decision to write the offer is the one who's the procuring cause. In this case, it, it wasn't Autumn. She wasn't involved. All right, any, any other questions? All right, I want to do a couple of other things. First of all, agency is a non-issue in procuring cause cases. And realtors will go to arbitrations and say, but I was their agent. And they would never buy a property through a listing agent. Well, that's irrelevant. Take your, take your client to properties and go with them. Don't have them go wander around on their own and don't send them out on their own. And let them know if you don't go with them, you probably aren't going to get paid. So agency is a non-issue. And the other thing I want to talk about is splitting. Hearing panels are not supposed to split the commission. They're supposed to determine who is the procuring cause and award that person the full commission. What the manual says is splitting is the exception, not the rule, and the commission should only be split if both competing realtors procured the buyer. What, how, how could two different competing realtors procure the buyer? Well, that would be if one of them procured the husband and one procured the wife. Does that happen? Yeah, that does happen. All right, and then, and then I want to talk about one more thing. The party requesting arbitration may file for what was offered in MLS. And, and actually, if, they, if it's a cooperating broker against a cooperating broker, they may file for what the other broker got paid plus anything the other broker paid out in a referral fee and or anything the other broker credited to the buyer at close of escrow. So in this example, the, the, the broker paid out a, a referral fee of $14,500. $14, and the, the person who was the complainant, and, and I advised her and I told her she had a very clear case to try to work it out with the other broker. What the other broker said was, no, you don't have a good case, I do. And I've been here for many years, you only came here recently. I know all the people on the hearing panel, so they're going to favor me. And we're only arbitrating for 23,000 because we paid 14,500 as a referral fee. So she arbitrated against him, she won, and she got 37,500, which means they had to come out of pocket 14,000, or 14,500. The other one is, the property, uh, the, the prospective buyer saw the property several times with the listing agent, had the listing agent do all kinds of research and provide this and provide that. This went on for a period of weeks. And when he finally reached the point where he decided he wanted to buy that property, he went to a, a realtor he had used in the past and said, just this one time, uh, will you credit the commission back to me? I've already found the property. I want to buy it. I want you to represent me. Will you credit the commission back to me? <laughs> he said, okay. So he credited the entire commission back to the buyer. This was a purchase of a luxury home. The amount offered through MLS would have been 96000 the real estate company credited 96000 to the buyer at close of escrow. How much did they get paid? Nothing. But you get to file for what the other broker got paid, which was nothing. 
Oh, but plus what they credited the buyer, which was? 96000 96, The listing broker, uh, after it closed, a listing broker and agent filed against the buyer's broker and agent. They filed for $96,000. They prevailed. The other, the other broker had to come out of pocket $96,000. Now, that's a valuable lesson. If you don't remember anything else from today, remember that one personally. When a buyer comes to you and they say, I've already found the property I want to buy, will you represent me and will you credit commission? What's your answer? No. What's no unless what? You can contact that other agent and see what you can work out and get it in writing, get a written agreement, and then do it. Okay, we're going to stop right here. Thank you very much for coming today. It's been a pleasure spending the day with you. Good luck.